For all the audience, welcome back to this uh, webinar. And this is uh, the occasion to also thank uh, IViewMet who have initiated this. We had this, for, uh, this uh, project of having virtual visiting professor before uh, the pandemic. And once the pandemic started, we, found, we thought that it's the best uh, occasion to have everybody uh, together to discuss some topics that are very important. And since we started, IViewMet have been very supportive. So thank you, Avi Umet, and thank you, Dr. Srini, for agreeing to give this talk on a very important topic. And for this time, we invited even the pediatric surgeons, not only urologists, because it's a topic that we, we share within us. So thank you for agreeing to be here and, uh, and for the talk you're going to start. Thank you. Great. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So I'm going to share my screen here. And let's see, let me get started. Okay, so just as an introduction, um, my name is Danielle Sweeney. I'm a pediatric urologist in Austin, Texas. Um, as I was just explaining, I did my residency and fellowship training um, at the University of Pittsburgh under uh, Dr. Francis Schneck. He was my boss for many years. Um, I know a lot of you have had the opportunity to meet him as he's done um, many IVU workshops um, over the last, gosh, probably about 15 years now. Um, I was first introduced to IVU Med um, in 2008 um, when um, Francis um, and I and a pretty large team uh, went to Ghana. Um, and um, that was my first introduction to, to doing these trips and absolutely fell in love with it. Um, I subsequently have done some trips in um, Guatemala with, a, with another organization, but reconnected with IVU last year um, and with Francis. And uh, we, in the fall, we were in Uganda in um, Mbale in the Mount Elgin Hospital. And um, most recently, uh, we were in uh, Kigali, Rwanda, just this past March, um, and unfortunately, our trip got cut a little short as the COVID pandemic kind of erupted while we were there, and the United States had a travel ban, and so we had to get home. So unfortunately, our, our trip was cut a little short, but we really um, enjoyed our partnership there, and um, we're really, I know both Francis and I, and actually all the IV Med docs are very excited to, to get back doing what we love doing the most. Um, so today, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, hypospadias complications. Um, and this is going to sort of build upon some of the other visiting lectures um, that IVU has been given. I know Dr. Schneck gave one on complex hypospadias repair, as did Dr. Chin. Um, and if you haven't had an opportunity to see those lectures, I know they're on the website, they're archived, and they're actually quite good. And so this lecture is going to build upon this a little bit, and we're going to focus more on, um, on complications and sort of what, what you can do to manage these complications and um, tips for improving techniques um, to reduce your complications. So as an introduction, um, hypospadias is the most common congenital malformation of the penis. It's characterized by three key findings um, and it exists on a spectrum of severity. Um, the urethral meatus is offset um, and is typically located on the ventral aspect of the penis. Um, the um, severity can be um, categorized as being distal, which is more mild, um, um, to more severe cases, such as the proximal hypospadias or the penis scrotal hypospadias. Um, also, as one of the key findings is the absence of foreskin on the ventral aspect of the glands. Um, and this has to do with underdevelopment. Um, this gives the penis the appearance of having a dorsal hooded prepuce. And it also, um, the third key component is the presence of cordy. And cordy is essentially ventral curvature of the penis. Um, the severity of cordy correlates with the degree of the urethral defect. So obviously the more severe curvature correlates with a more proximal urethral opening. Other findings that, that may or may not be present with the hypospadias complex are a bifid scrotum. That is typically something we see in the more severe cases. Um, penis scrotal transposition, when the um, scrotum is actually um, 
more transposed on the dorsal aspect of the penis. Again, something we see in the more severe cases. And um, the megameatus intact prepuce variant of hypospadias. Um, and this is a variant which is, is, is fairly common um, and um, it sometimes goes undiagnosed for a period of time just because of the intact prepuce. So just to touch upon the embryology of the penis, the hypospadias complex arises from um, an arrest of penile development between eight and 14 weeks gestation. Um, testosterone at that time is synthesized by the Leydig cells in the fetal testes. And in the external genitalia, testosterone is then converted to the more potent androgen dihydrotestosterone by the enzyme 5-alpha reductase. The male urethra forms by fusion of the genital folds under the influence of these androgens in normal development. So hypospadias then occurs when there is failure of ventral, urethral, and propucial fusion. This ultimately leads um, to you to have a offset urethral meatus, and you can kind of see that right here. Um, corporal ventral uh, curvature, when this is a great example of that, and deficiency of ventral penile shaft skin. I'm not sure if you guys can see this picture. It's kind of being covered by some of the um, uh, attendees, but um, this is essentially, you can see it here where you have more dorsal skin, less ventral skin, um, and you have sort of just an unevenness um, there. The etiology of hypospadias is not fully understood. Um, a number of factors can interrupt um, this stage of embryologic development. However, for the majority of children with hypospadias, the cause is, is likely multifactorial and unable to be fully determined. We know that maternal factors influence this, um, including um, the age of the mother at the time of gestation, exposures to um, androgen disruptors in the environment. Um, and then in a small percentage of hypospadias patients, we know that there are some androgen receptor mutations um, and defects in function, um, and also some subtle defects in the quantity or timing of androgen synthesis by the fetal testis. And so this can all impact the embryologic development of the penis. The uh, incidence of hypospadias um, has been uh, recently said it, that it's increasing, but that's a little bit of um, maybe a misnomer. So in the United States right now, they're saying the incidence of hypospadias is about one in 125 to one in 250 male births. And they say the incidence of hypospadias in non-whites is increasing. Um, much of this data is sort of complicated by reporting criteria, and it's unknown if the incidence is truly increasing or we're just doing a better job diagnosing and recording this. Um, for a long time, for many decades, very mild cases of hypospadias were not even noted um, and certainly did not come to for treatment. So it's just unclear if we're now recording these more mild cases that our incidence is now reported to be increasing. Um, there are familial clusters of hypospadias, and this is a well-recognized entity. 10% um, of patients have an affected relative, and we know it's equally passed through maternal and paternal bloodlines. Um, hypospadias is, is multifactorial, as I stated before. Um, there's genetic and environmental contributions. Genetic mutations are identified upwards in 30% of cases, but 70% of cases are relatively unknown. Um, majority of boys with hypospadias have no health problems and they're considered to have isolated hypospadias. So they're basically healthy kids with the exception of this one congenital um, abnormality. Um, hypospadias is associated with multiple syndromes. Um, this is obviously a smaller percentage of hypospadias kids, but those syndromes include Wagger, Dennis Drash, smith lemmy opitz and um, differences in sexual development. So in order to make the diagnosis of hypospadias, it's really a physical exam issue. And, and most kids present at the time of birth or during early infancy. Delayed presentations are not uncommon, particularly with kids with the megameatus intact prepuce variant. Um, because the foreskin is intact and if uh, families chose not to uncircumcise them, some of these kids don't present until later childhood or even at puberty when the foreskin is finally able to be retracted to expose the head of the penis. Bladder and kidney imaging are not necessary unless the child has a malformation syndrome that you are also working up. Um, and one other thing that's really important to note if you're evaluating a child with hypospadias is the presence of an undescended testis. Um, we know that um, difference of sexual development, DSD kids, um, should be this diagnosis should be considered when one of the testes is non-palpable. 
um, or and also in the inguinal canal, or both testes are non-palpable. And in this situation, a karyotype should be considered. Surgical intervention is the only known treatment for hypospadias, um, and um, there's three goals of hypospadias surgery, no matter what the technique that you do. Um, basically, you want to create an orthotopically um, unobstructed slit-like meatus on the glands um, so that the child can void in the standing position. You want to straighten the penis to um, enhance straight erections um, so that you have good sexual function, sexual intercourse isn't painful, um, you have good optimal delivery of sperm, um, and also a straight penis is going to allow for optimal voiding. Um, the third key component is a cosmetically appropriate phallus that kind of follows cultural norms in, in your community. So timing of hypospadias surgery, there's been a lot of discussion about that. And I think it varies um, depending where in the world you are. Um, in 1996, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the section of urology recommended that hypospadias surgery ideally should be done between six and 12 months of age. Um, and there was uh, three key reasons why they recommended that time frame. One was anesthesia risks. Um, anesthesia risks decrease significantly after six months of age in an infant due to maturity of the pulmonary system. Um, not to say you can't do a, a hypospadias surgery earlier, but there are significant um, anesthesia risks. And so the benefits of doing it earlier um, may not outweigh the risks in that specific situation. There are also some um, pretty significant psychosocial factors. Um, and it's advocated if you could ideally avoid surgery be between 18 months of age and three years, um, that's ideal. And the reason why is that's sort of the time period of what we in the United States call the terrible twos. It's, it's that toddler age group when they're, um, they're just kind of sometimes difficult to deal with. And, and it's difficult to rationalize with a two-year-old. They also are getting a more onset of genital awareness. So they can just be, it's just a difficult time period to um, have a complex surgery be performed because post-operative issues are, are difficult to control. There's also some technical aspects of the repair that make it more ideal to um, have the surgery be done in the infant age group. Um, there are lower complication rates reported in the literature when the surgeries were performed at one year versus at five years of age. Um, and at age older than two years, there was a significant predictor of complication um, in, in one particular um, um, large series. Now, not to say that, again, we don't operate on children older than this age group. We certainly do, particularly if there's delayed presentation or reason why surgery needs to be delayed. But I think it's important to note that if your child is older, particularly puberty age or right before the onset of puberty, it's really important to discuss with the family that complication rates change significantly. Um, many of the complication rates that are reported in the literature are for infants. And so it's just you cannot give the same um, incidence of a fistula, for example, in a 14-year-old boy versus a six-month-old. And so I think that's just, just important to note, particularly when you're um, counseling patients. Preoperative hormone stimulation. I just wanted to bring this up just because this is a little bit of a controversial um, um, topic. Um, initially, there was a push to do preoperative hormone stimulation because it was felt that the repairs were technically easier because the penis size increased, um, the vascularity and the thickness of the tissues were improved, um, and, um, and, and there was a, a push to do this. However, some studies, more recent studies have sort of, um, have sort of refuted this. Um, there was a study recently that suggested that st hormone stimulation might interfere with wound healing um, and actually increase the complication rate. So I think most surgeons now will not advocate preoperative hormone stimulation routinely, but save it for, for special patients who have severe hypospadias, poor tissues, a microphallus or a very small gland size. Personally, I, that, that's, I, I don't use hormone stimulation often, but if I do, it's in that particular patient population. It's usually the tissues are just, just very poor and you know you're not going to have a good outcome. And I, and I think hormone stimulation works quite well, well in them. Um, I'm not going to go through all the surgical treatments of hypospadias. As you know, there's hundreds, um, but they, there is a commonality amongst all the procedures in that the end goal is to get a um, good result. Um, 
The problem with um, looking at the outcomes of hypospadias surgery is very few studies have systematically compared outcomes for the different repairs. And given the variability of gland size, location of the meatus, penile size, and the degree of curvature, no one technique is appropriate for all patients. Um, surgical treatment really depends on the location of the meatus, the quality of the urethral plate, the spongiosum, the size of the glands, and um, the curvature of the penis, as well as the quality of the skin. Also, high volume surgeons, regardless of their technique, have better outcomes than low volume surgeons. And so there's been a real push in the United States to develop center of excellences, um, or, and also to identify one or two surgeons per institution to do the more complex hypospadias cases. This really prevents dilution of the experience. And, and I think that's really important. I mean, the learning curve is pretty significant particularly with the complex cases. Um, I know when I started out in practice, I mean, it took me probably at least almost two to three years before I was really comfortable doing a complex proximal hypospadias. Um, and it just took numbers. It was just doing them over and over again. Now, if those cases are not as common as some of the, the more mild cases. And so if, if you have a lot of surgeons that are doing one case a year or a couple cases a year, you're really just not going to build up um, um, your skill level. So in surgical technique, again, regardless of what type of repair you do, there's four, um, there's four, there's four key steps. The first step is the penile straightening step, which is what we call the orthoplasty. The second step is the creation of the new ure urethra, which is the urethroplasty portion. The third step is creation of the penile glands and the urethral meatus, the glanuloplasty and the meatoplasty. And the fourth step um, is um, when you circumcision and coverage of the deficient ventral penile shaft skin. So for the first step, penile straightening, the goal is to correct the ventral curvature of the penis. 75% um, of patients with penile curvature can be corrected with just degloving of the ventral skin to the penis girdle junction. Um, and one way to check that is, is after degloving, um, um, the, the curvature can be assessed with an injection of saline with a, when you have a tourniquet on. It's essentially an artificial erection. If the curvature looks like it, it's, it disappears, then that's all you need to do. You, you've taken care of it by degloving the skin. However, if curvature is still present, but it seems to be fairly mild um, and can be straightened with a gentle pressure at the most um, point of the, of the bend, then it's probably appropriate to do a dorsal midline permanent plication suture. Um, that's probably all you need to do to correct the curvature. However, it should be noted that aggressive use of dorsal plication sutures may lead to penile shortening or recurrent curvature. And the one thing you want to avoid is, is if you put in a plication suture and it still looks like there's a little bit of a bend and you put in another one and you're still not happy with it, it still looks like there's a bend and then you're tempted to put a third one in, I would stop. I think at that point, it's time to look at other techniques. You might need to do more mobilization of the urethral plate. I think beyond two plication sutures, you're really running the risk of, of some complications um, um, and recurrent curvature issues. Now, if you do an artificial erection after degloving of the penis and the curvature is greater than 30 degrees, um, it's really the best course of action at that point is to mobilize the urethral plate. Um, severe curvature might be, may be corrected with division and proximal mobilization of the urethral plate. Um, a defect is then needed to pat, may be needed to patch, and that can be a, a graft such as dermis graft, tunica vaginalis flap, or even buccal mucosa flaps. In step two, the creation of the new urethra, the goal is to advance the urethral meatus to the orthotopic location on the glands. Um, in distal hypospadias, um, meatal advancement procedures work quite well. These would be the magpie uh, procedure, the metu, or the flip flap. Um, for distal and mid-shaft hypospadias, so that's when the urethral meatus is subcoronal or mid-shaft, um, a tip procedure works great and has really sort of become, I don't want to say the standard of care, but it certainly has become the um, procedure of choice. Uh, for this type of hypospadias. Um, alternate, alternatively, you can do a propucial onlay island flap, um, and this can be used to augment the urethral plate if it's too narrow. Um, and, and there's also uh, some other, you know, variety of other techniques you can use. For mid-shaft and proximal hypospadias, uh, there are one or two stage repairs. 
Um, in my practice, um, even for some of the more proximal one, we're really trying to do one stage repairs. Um, you know, for obvious reasons, the less times a, a patient has to undergo anesthesia, the better. Um, certainly, if you can get everything done in one stage, that's just a better situation for the family. But that's not always the case. And, and sometimes a two stage repair is really the better option. Um, one or two stage repairs can all be done with onlay island flaps, pedicle flaps, free grafts, buckle grafts, and dermal grafts. Um, and really, I think right now, buckle grafts have really become popular um, and in urethral reconstruction in general. And what's great about a buckle mucosal flap is it can be used as in primary repairs. It can be used in a one stage, a two stage, and it can also be used in failed repairs. It's just a really robust um, um, good tissue that has really good universal use. Um, after you create your neo-urethra, there should always be a second layer of um, a buttressing layer of well-vascularized tissue that's on top of the anastomosis, and that's kind of your waterproofing layer. Um, um, Dartos um, tissue is usually what's used, and what's nice about Dartos is that these flaps can be raised from the dorsal or lateral skin for coverage over the neo-urethra. Um, sometimes you don't have a lot of Dartos tissue, and that's just not not something you can use. Um, so tunica vaginalis flaps or even scrotal flaps can be used as a second layer of coverage. This is a really, really important step because if not done correctly or even omitted, um, your fistula rates are very high. So um, really um, the decrease in fistulas really are, are, came about because of this important step. In the third step, the glenuloplasty and meatoplasty, um, the goal here is to create a rounded appearance to the glands uh, with a wide open slit meatus. Um, the glands needs to be of adequate width to allow for an appropriately sized neourethral channel with midline closure. Um, and so it's known that the smaller the, or the, smaller the glands, you're increased you have increased complications. So the number that, that's kind of thrown out there is if your glands is smaller than 14 millimeters, then, then your complications go up. When you close the glands, it should be tension free once it's closed. Um, a tight glands can lead to dehiscence with regression of the urethral opening. So one thing I like to look at when I do this is when I close the glands in the midline, if the tissue looks white or blanched, that's probably a good indication that it's way too tight and you, you're, you're starting to affect your, your vascularization. Um, and in that case, um, I, I would advocate not tying that down and not closing it that way. And I think it's a good idea to go back, look at your mucosal flaps. Um, the glands wings sometimes just need to be extended. Um, and, um, and even sometimes your, your, your transverse, um, your your incised plate needs to even maybe be a little bit more aggressive in order just to get a little bit more room so that you can bring your, um, your glands flaps over without tight tension. So skin coverage. Now the goal for skin coverage is to create a, most commonly a circumcised appearance with coverage of the original deficient ventral penile skin flaps. Um, this is most commonly done with buyer's flaps, which uses redundant dorsal perpetual skin, which is transposed ventrally um, with its vascular pedicle. Now violation of the vascular supply to these flaps can lead to skin dehiscence, necrosis, and scarring of the shaft skin. Um, this can give you a shortened tethered appearance to the penis. Um, and the scarred area sometimes is very unacceptable in terms of cosmetic outcome. So looking at complications following hypospadia surgery, this is a really, I would say it's a frustrating topic in pediatric urology because there really has been a lack of standard definitions for hypospadias complications. Um, there's such variability in reporting and inconsistency in the literature. And when we go back and look at what's been published, the, these papers really are poor scientific quality. Um, a lot of them are retrospective studies, they're small cohort studies. Um, the variation of techniques and, the, and what their outcomes are are often really poorly defined. So it's really difficult to, to compare across studies. Um, and there's also a lack of independent outcome assessment. And so it's hard to um, really take their results. You almost have to take them with a grain of salt. Um, so for an example of this, you know, if you currently look in the literature, there's such a wide range 
range of complication rates from the complication rate, if you look, is ranges from five to 70 percent. I mean, that's a huge, huge range. Now, granted, that's lumping in both distal and proximal, but even still, that's a pretty significant wide range, which tells you it's, it, it, the literature doesn't guide you very well and when you need to counsel patients. Now, we do know that secondary surgery rate for distal hypospadias hovers around 10 percent. Um, and that complications can also extend into adulthood. So 40% of men with a history of severe hypospadias will report some level of voiding problems. 20% of these men will have sexual function problems. So again, it's very important to follow these, these young kids um, into adulthood. Um, you know, I, the way I approach follow-up is I certainly, in the first year after surgery, I see those kids obviously more frequently. After that, I usually check in with them at the time of toilet training. Um, and then after that, if they're not having any issues or problems, I usually check in with them again um, as um, they are entering puberty and young adulthood. Um, just because some complications, late complications can pop up, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, um, that are not evident when they're young children, but once they go through puberty, become a, a big issue for them. Um, there's been a push recently to standardize hypospadias complications into a classification system. Um, and uh, Warren Snodgrass, um, who's also um, out of Texas, um, has recommended um, classifying these into three different categories. The first being um, complications related to skin issues, and that can include scarred shaft skin, concealed penises, just poor cosmetic outcomes. Um, urethral complications, which um, is the umbrella over the urethrocutaneous fistulas, um, yellow stenosis, glands, dehiscence, strictures, diverticulums. And then the third category is the persistence of penile curvature. Um, and those are the, typically they're older kids who've gone through puberty um, that uh, present with curved painful erections, uh, difficulty aiming urinary stream, really functional issues of their penis because of persistent um, curve. Now we're going to talk first about the skin issues and skin complications. So skin complications are generally perceived as being mild. However, they can have some devastating cosmetic implications. Um, skin complications are likely underreported. In the literature, they're only listed as 2% incidence rate, but it's very common in a lot of studies that it's not even mentioned at all. So it doesn't mean that they don't exist. It's just it's just probably not being reported. Um, penile concealment, buried periness, excess penile skin, in this new classification system, um, it's, it's, the definition is that there's excess skin greater than two centimeters in a circumcised patient when the suprapubic fat is retracted. Um, for scarred shaft skin, scar defect in the prepucial skin uh, um, recreates basically a scarred down incomplete prepuce um, and gives you a poor cosmetic outcome. So this is a picture right here of um, a typical penile concealment buried penis after a hypospadias repair. And so what happens is, is typically the excess skin um, occurs and with postoperative edema and deficiency of penile shaft tethering. So one way you can prevent this is at the time of your initial surgery is really focus on technique. You want to avoid causes of excess edema. So that would be prolonged tourniquet time um, or excessive use of cautery that causes swelling within the tissues. Now with penile shaft tethering, this is more of a um, inherent patient characteristic. So I, I have to say in the United States, we have a lot of uh, young infants. I will say that they are maybe overnourished a little bit, um, and they're nice and chubby. They have very large suprapubic fat pads. And in these patients, the, the penis, if it's not tethered correctly, will, will sink down into that fat pad. This can be avoided by placing anchoring sutures in Buck's fascia at the penopubic junction. It just needs to be recognized um, at the time of your surgery that you know there's a large suprapubic fat pad. The body habitus suggests that it's going to um, the it's likely that the penis might sink, um, and so you just have to be prepared for that and make sure that you are doing proper tethering. Now, treatments for for penile concealment um, typically we start with a, a more um, um, I would say conservative approach. Topical steroids work well if you're just dealing with a phimosis, um, but oftentimes these kids require revision of the circumcision. But the good news is, is this is usually a pretty straightforward procedure and often does not require um, a catheter. 
Um, other skin complications, scarred um, shaft skin. This typically results from when you have devascularization of the flap with necrosis. Um, this can be caused by um, hematomas, um, wound infections, vascular spasm, tight pressure dressing. Um, it, it may be superficial um, and heal without permanent damage, um, but it may not. And this is a good example of this picture here of a really scarred, uh, contracted ventral shaft skin um, um, from, from dehiscence. Um, when the shaft skin is, is scarred like that, it can start to also cause ventral curvature of the penis, which we'll address in a few minutes, um, but it really can have some significant um, um, complications. Treatment of this, um, local treatment of the wound when it's, it's in the pre or the perioperative stage, um, if there is dehiscence, we let that heal secondarily, um, but you need to monitor for poor cosmetic outcome and contraction of the wound. Um, in situations where there is contraction of the wound and you are getting ventral curvature, um, surgical options include rearrangement of the penile skin, um, and in some more significant cases, um, actual skin grafting. So shifting gears a little bit, urethral complications, these by far are the most common complications we see with hypospadias repair. Um, and the most commonly reported urethral complication is a urethral cutaneous fistula. So essentially this is a, when a urethral opening um, develops anywhere below the reconstructed meatus. Um, this can be on the glands, this can be on the shaft, it really just depends. Um, another complication we see are glands dehiscence, and that's complete separation of the glands wings, um, resulting in coronal and more proximal retraction of the meatus. Um, meatal stenosis can occur, as can urethral strictures and urethral diverticulums. For urethral cutaneous fistula, like I said, it's the most commonly reported surgical complication after hypospadias repair. Incidence is 10% um, in short-term follow-up. It's likely greater. Um, the more proximal the repair, the higher the fistula rate. And fistulas, again, can develop anywhere along the length of the urethroplasty. Although most often at the site of the original urethral meatus, um, they can develop in other places as well. Um, sometimes it's very, they're very large defects and you, it's very obvious. Other times it can be very pinpoint and, and difficult to see. Um, oftentimes we'll have parents come in and say, um, you know, I'm seeing two urine streams when he voids or in children that are toilet trained, um, parents will say, all of a sudden, well, he now has wet underwear and he's dribbling, he's dribbling and he, he, he's wet all the time. Those are kind of the signs that there might be a fistula present. And so it, it's, it's important to investigate that. The development of a fistula is multifactorial, um, ischemia, edema of the tissues, again, wound infections, um, anything that contributes to improper healing of the neo-urethra can um, predispose to a, a fistula. Um, distal urethral obstruction from meatal stenosis or urethral stricture um, results in a scenario where there's high urethral pressures and you can essentially just blow out your anastomosis and then a fistula develops. Um, overlapping suture lines from poor surgical technique um, or inadequate inversion of the epithelium or even just the use of the wrong suture material can also contribute to fistula formation. So that's why really um, honing your craft and, and really um, making sure your technique is really refined is so important. Now the bad news about fistulas is, is fistulas recur about 20% of the time following initial fistula repair. So unfortunately, this can become a chronic, chronic recurring issue for your patients. And I think that's really important when you counsel them, you, you need to tell them that, you know, even though you have a fistula, we're gonna repair it, your odds of getting another fistula um, is 20%. And after that, it, it tends to increase even more. So how do we manage these things? Well, the management of the fistula depends on the number, the size, and the location, um, and if there are any other additional complications. Majority of fistulas require surgical repair, and we typically delay this until at least six to 12 months after the initial hypospadias repair to allow for wound healing and tissue softening. Um, you need to carefully evaluate these fistulas in the operating room because sometimes they can be um, hard to hard to really uh, quantify. Um, calibration of the meatus with a bougie to assess for patency of the urethra is very important. Um, if urethral structure or stricture is um, suspected, um, cystoscopy should be performed in order to evaluate the urethra. 
If the fistula is not easily identified, sometimes they can be pinpoint and you, you can't see them very well. A saline, saline injected through a feeding tube um, in, into the distal portion of the urethra with the proximal portion of the urethra compressed usually will reveal the fistula tract. Um, if you have access to methylene blue, which is a type of dye, sometimes it's good to put that into the saline. And um, when you inject that, um, you, you see little bits of blue dye and you can localize your fistula um, easily. So small caliber fistulas um, on the penile shaft proximal to the coronal margin can be closed primarily. Um, and it's uh, in order for success in this type of um, fistula, it is absolutely necessary to excise the epithelialized tract. Um, if you don't do this, your fistula is going to recur. It's not, go it's go not going to heal correctly. The urethelial edges can be closed in a sub-epithelial fashion. Um, and it's really important, again, to put those multiple overlapping layers uh, to prevent um, recurrence. So your buttressing layer, your waterproofing layer. Um, use of multiple well-vascularized non-epithelialized layers between the urethral closures and the skin, such as dartos tissue or scrotal-based tunica vaginalis flap is really going to lend to success. Um, the use of catheters um, for small fistulas aren't necessary. I don't typically use them. Um, it, it, of course, every patient is, is a bit different, but for the most part, if it's a small fistula repair, I, I don't leave a catheter in place. Now, obviously, larger fistulas or those that are present with poor tissue coverage, um, those are a little bit more involved. Catheters are absolutely left, and sometimes some of them require an island flap or, um, um, you know, to, to make sure that that area gets covered. Fistulas at the coronal margin, um, although they're more distal, are actually more difficult to repair. Um, revision of the urethroplasty and glansplasty to get a satisfactory repair is, is actually necessary. If you try to, to do an isolated primary fistula at the coronal margin, um, you're, you're probably going to set yourself up for failure. It's just a tough area with how all the tissues come into play. Glans dehiscence. Um, glans dehiscence it's, is essentially complete separation of the glans wings, resulting in a coronal or more proximal meatus. Um, this occurs in 4% of distal and 15% of proximal tip repairs. Um, again, this is likely underreported due to some cases not using needing operative um, reoperative intervention, so therefore they're just not reported. Um, and gland systems can be due to a combination of factors. Um, small glands width, like we talked about before, typically less than 14 millimeters in, in length, um, or excuse me, in width, has been proposed to be an independent risk factor for complications after hypospadias repair. Um, catheter tension on the repair um, is, is one of the major causes of this. So it's very important once you place your catheter to make sure it's not on tension. It's important to educate your nursing who, nursing staff who's gonna be taking care of the patient postoperatively. And of course the parents who are gonna be going home with this catheter. Um, they need to, everyone needs to recognize what too much tension on the repair um, looks like. Um, it, we talked about it before, too much tension on the glands closure um, leads to dehiscence. Um, and this is mainly due to vascular compromise. Um, Reoperation may not be necessary um, in glands dehiscence. It's going to depend on the presence of voiding symptoms. Um, and um, in, in some kids, when reoperation is necessary, the glands closure and inlay graft might be required because you're just, it's just too small to be able to bring it over um, um, primarily. Meatal stenosis, we'll touch upon this quickly. Um, the definition for meatal stenosis varies considerably. So again, we're trying to standardize this for hypospadias repairs. And per our new classification system, um, meatal stenosis is obstructive voiding symptoms and narrowed meatal calibration. So if the meatus is less than eight French before puberty and less than 12 French after puberty, and you have obstructive voiding symptoms, that will qualify as a meatal stenosis. Um, the risk of narrowing increases um, if the urethral closure extends too distally or if the glands is closed with too much tension. It's really tempting when you do some of these cases to try to get that urethral meatus at the very tip of the glands. And in reality, that's not a good thing. You don't want to do that because that's just going to set you up for meatal stenosis. Um, it's better to um, not be right at the distal aspect of the tip of the glands and um, and this will allow you to have a, a better opening. 
treatment. Uh, rarely can a st stenotic meatus be managed conservatively. Some people try to do it with meatal dilation, with sounds or topical steroids, but more commonly a redo urethroplasty is indicated or a glansplasty. Um, every now and then your tissues are good enough where you can just do a cutback and you, you know, evert the mucosal edges, um, but you have to have really good tissues for that. And sometimes we're just not seeing that with hypospadias repairs. So urethral strictures. Um, Urethral strictures are, you, you will typically present with obstructive voiding symptoms with visual near closure of the urethra, which extends proximally in, into the urethra. These strictures tend to form at the junction of the native and neourethra along the path of the neourethra. Um, and the clinical picture can vary widely, but usually um, kids will come in with complaints of a diminished urine stream, um, forceful urination, urinary retention, urinary tract infections. Those are usually the typical signs of this. Several factors increase the risk of postoperative stricture, improper technique, um, tissue ischemia, trauma infection are the big ones. So again, going back to really honing your craft and really perfecting your technique, be very gentle with your tissues. You want to make sure when you're picking them up, you're not crushing them and, and damaging the microscopic blood supply. Um, so technique is a really big factor on this. Um, urethral stricture treatment options, short strictures with minimal symptoms, Sometimes you can get away with just doing urethral dilation or an endoscopic incision, but that's rarely a long-term solution. That might buy you a little bit of time, but it's likely they're going to come back with a stricture in the future. Um, extensive strictures or those that fail conservative management, uh, revision urethroplasty is recommended. Um, this can be achieved with local skin flaps using buccal mucosa. Um, and um, when you go and look at these patients, typically you see significant tissue loss at the side of the stricture. Urethral diverticulums. So urethral diverticulums is a visual saccularization of the urethra um, that you typically see during voiding. And so in symptoms, typically they'll report a weak urine stream, post-void dribbling, UTIs, um, the patient might notice ballooning of the penile shaft during voiding um, or report that they need to milk the residual urine from the penile urethra. Diverticula, um, they occur more commonly in boys who have undergone perpetual flaps um, and two-stage repairs and proximal repairs. And this is in part anatomically because the lack of spongiosal tissue in the neourethra um, isn't there to act as a reinforcement. And so um, you need some reinforcement during your normal urethral voiding. Um, and if that's not present, you can get this outpouching. So treatment of urethral diverticulum, a small diverticulum can be excised and reduced, uh, returning the urethral lumen to a uniform caliber. Um, extensive diverticulum are repaired by excising the redundant diverticular tissue, urethral closure, and a multi-layered reinforcement be um, before you close your skin. So persistent penile curvature. So this is probably, I would say, one of the most devastating complications that can occur. And really this has severe consequences on both urinary and sexual function. Residual curvature may worsen as boys go through puberty and may not even present until puberty. Um, and that's why I always advocate that you probably need a little bit longer term follow up on your hypospadias patients. Even you know if you operated them on an infant and they looked great during childhood, it's best to see them at least once or twice once they've gone through puberty so you can assess um, um, erections and also um, sexual function um, in older kids. Persistence of curvature occurs when the curvature is underestimated or the repair is incomplete. So again, that's when you go back and you, when you do your artificial erection, you really need to be meticulous about looking at the um, uh, degree of curvature and really documenting this and doing a, a really thorough job in, in repairing that. Um, Curvature can also be the result of tethering of the urethral plate um, or ventral skin contraction following scarring. We talked about that um, a little bit earlier. Um, stage procedures are usually necessary to treat this, and, and sometimes it takes upwards to three stages to, to correct this. The first stage assesses the cause of the curvature with release of the scar tissue under the skin with possible uh, corporoplasty, just depending on the scenario that you see. The second stage is placement of the buccal graft. And typically the third, third stage is the urethroplasty and skin closure. So really this can be um, a process to, to take care of. Um, 
And oftentimes, oops, excuse me, oftentimes you're dealing with older, you know, older kids as well. So um, this can be a really, like I said, pretty devastating complication. So just some considerations in hypospadias reoperation. Reoperative hypospadias repairs encompass a spectrum of operative procedures. Some of them can be simple, like a simple fistula or some a circumcision for skin redundancy and can be managed with just one intervention. But some of these complications are recurrent, they're chronic, and um, might require pretty extensive um, multi-stage repairs or, or just extensive surgeries. So there's really a variety of, of of considerations when you talk about hypospadias reoperation. The tissue that's available for reoperative hypospadias is variable among patients, but the quality of the tissues decreases with each trip to the operating room. Um, each procedure leaves the penis progressively scarred with changes to the established blood supply. Um, so the term hypospadias cripple, which has been used for many decades, really kind of describes this patient. So that's really the poor patient who's had repeated unsuccessful repairs and poor outcomes, you know, over time and has had multiple trips to the operating room. And I don't know if you can see this picture here, but this is a good example of, of what that looks like. Um, you know, cosmetically, the, the penis looks very poor. Um, and from a functional standpoint, both urinary and sexual function, um, a lot of problems. So this is a really kind of devastating, um, I would almost say like an end stage hypospadias patient. Um, um, and they're really difficult to treat because your treatment options just um, get limited as time goes on. With regards to reoperative hyperspadius, um, extra genital skin harvest can be used in the setting of a salvage repair. Um, several donor sites exist and have been used with variable success. Um, as I stated before, buccal mucosa is really now sort of the graft of choice for complex penile reconstruction, um, both in the primary and reoperative setting. Dermal grafts have been used and certainly still can be used. Um, but, but some, the full thickness skin grafts frequently fail, secondary to graft shrinkage, scarring, stricture formation, and this kind of limits their use. So touching upon buccal mucosa, it's really, it's an amazing tissue and it's pretty ideally suited for urethral repairs. Um, it's well adapted for contact with both fluid and air. Um, it readily neovascularizes, it's hairless, um, harvesting of the tissue results in little damage to the donor site, um, and uh, buccal mucosa can be used in single or multiple um, stage procedures. Um, the buccal mucosa can be harvested from either the cheek or the inner lip, um, and really minimal, again, minimal look, uh, local complications at the donor site. Um, there is a little bit of a learning curve just because as urologists, we're not used to working in the mouth, but you know, once you've done a few and kind of been walked through it, it's actually a, a fairly straightforward uh, procedure. Um, buccal mucosa taking from the lower lip, um, in my opinion, um, is better suited for, for glands reconstruction because it's a little bit thinner than the tissue from the cheek. Um, and you don't really want bulky um, tissue in the glands because that makes it very difficult for, to close. Um, when you're harvesting buccal mucosa, the graft should be harvested about 10% larger than the measured receiving site to allow for a little bit of graft contraction as it incorporates into the native tissues, but that's actually a pretty small percentage. So um, you're not, um, you can, you, it's, it's, it's a good, I, I think that's an acceptable um, contraction rate. Um, ideally, the graft should be given at least six months to heal before proceeding with urethroplasty and skin closure if you're performing a multi-stage procedure. But what's really great about buccal, because it, it just, it, it takes so well, is you can use it in, for a one-stage procedure. You can harvest and create your uh, neourethra all in the same procedure. So you don't always have to wait. But if you're planning on a multi-stage procedure, it's probably best to wait six months. So our take home message today is the understanding of complication rates um, will improve once there's standardization in the reporting of surgical outcomes. Um, and this really is gonna lead to improved patient counseling over time. Um, you have a much better discussion with your, your patients and they have a much better understanding of what their hypospadias journey is going to look like when you're able to actually counsel them correctly and accurately. Um, we really need reporting across institutions. Um, this is going to allow us to have larger volume series and longer follow-up windows um, and really um, 
just give us larger cohorts um, in order to get more accurate um, complication and outcome reports. Um, and just as a general rule of thumb, the higher volume surgeon equals better outcomes. Okay, so thank you. And um, I enjoyed giving this lecture today. Is, um, does anybody have any questions? Um, my email is also up there. So if you want to jot that down and send me a question by email, that's, that, that works as well too. But I'm happy to um, entertain any questions. Thank you so much for this very existive and very interesting talk that you really almost cover all the aspects of the hypospedias repair. As I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, in some countries, hypospedias is taken care of by only pediatric surgeon, but yeah. in most of our countries, the urologists take mm -hmm. care of it. And, and in most centers, there is a limited training at the initial, as part of the initial treatment. So yes. it's very important that we have a, 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 a update like this. For now, I have one question yes. uh, about uh, the direction, duration of hormonal treatment in mm -hmm. case of my penis to, yes. to, to make it effective. Mm -hmm. So that's going to depend on what you use. Um, I have used both topical and injection. And I think sometimes it, it, it depends on the ability for patients to come into your clinic um, their access to care will will factor in on what you decide to use. So for injection therapy, um, I typically have done it at four weeks prior and then two weeks prior. Um, for the topical, again, your topical treatment is tough because you're you're really giving up control to the parents, and the parents need to put it on, and so you're a little bit at their. Um, you don't know if they're doing it correctly or not. Um, typically for topical. I, I, usually it's about a four to six week course. Um, and again, and that's, it's, it's variable whether or not the parents do it correctly. I, if I'm going to do hormone replacement therapy I, or hormone therapy, I, I prefer to do injection just because I know they're getting it and it's, it's more accurate. But sometimes it's hard for patients to come in. You know, that's always a rate limiting step. Thank you. And then we have Dr. Howell to ask about uh, which type of uh, catheter do you use? Do you use specialized a catheter or you just use feeding tubes? Um, yeah. That's a good question. Um, for, I prefer for younger kids, infants, I actually prefer feeding tubes. Um, I Ultimately, I would like to get an eight French catheter in, uh, or excuse me, an eight French feeding tube in place. Um, and then I usually suture that feeding tube to the glands. Um, you know, I think if you if you leave like a five French feeding tube, you run the risk of one that tells you that your your you know your your neourethra is probably kind of narrow, and so you run the risk of I think stenosis a little bit. Um, so I think a feeding tube, like I said, works great in older kids who are toilet trained. I will try to use a catheter, like a Foley catheter, just because you know a seven year old boy, for example, who's toilet trained doesn't like to be in diapers. So if they're, like I said, if they're toilet trained, I think a Foley catheter works well. If they're not toilet trained, a feeding tube works great. Okay, thank you. And, and there is one comment I would like to take to, to ask you about, and then there is another question. The comment is uh, related to the type of instruments, and I think that's the big yes. challenge. And yes. also the need to, for, uh, for surgical loops. And yes. to that, I will add one question from Dr. Mbushe who asked, which type of suture do you use? So for my hepaspadius repairs, I typically like to use um, 6 o vicral or 7 o vicral for the anastomosis. Um, and um, I like vicral uh, because of the shorter absorption time. I think some of the sutures like PDS, um, they just take too long to, to reabsorb and you can get a lot of inflammation. Um, so um, I, I do like Vicryl, I tend to use it a lot. Um, and, and, and especially when we travel, I think it's a fairly easy suture to get. It's not, uh, I mean, the size of this, the smaller sutures are sometimes harder to get, but Vicryl is pretty universal. So I think it's a, it's, it works well. And um, I think it's, it's a good suture to use. And, and do you use a, 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 a interrupted or continuous suturing? 
I use, I, I will say I use uh, a continuous, um, but I do put little stay sutures like halfway um, in case the suture was to break. You know, I don't want that to unravel. So I usually will bisect at different points, um, put in an interrupted, but then I usually run, I do a running subcuticular for my neourethras. We have one more question sure. from Dr. Howlett uh, asking, about when do you use a buccal mucosa in primary cases? So um, again, I use them um, if the urethral plate is very poor, um, if there is significant um, ventral curvature and we have to mobilize or even transect the urethral plate. Um, I, I think, you know, oftentimes I, I in my hands, I've, I've been pretty lucky with doing tip repairs, even for some of the more proximal hypospadiasis, and my complication rates have been fairly low. So I will attempt to do that, but sometimes you, it's inevitable and you have to use um, a graft. And so um, really I'm kind of reserving that for the more severe cases. Okay, thank you. And uh, how long do you keep the catheter uh, post-operatively? Um, seven days. Seven days. Seven days. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I think we have a, a past president of PAUSA, Professor uh, Bumi Olaopa. If you can unmute him, we'd like him to say a word because he's, uh, he's been very instrumental in uh, uh, anchoring PAUSA in, all, in many of the international organizations that allow us partly to be here today. Yes. Dr. Bumi, I think he's muted before he get connected. Um, yeah, we have a, so, so what is your comment about the instruments? And, and I know that's a very mm -hmm. key, and for us, we have Dr. Madina who is in, in this call also. Mm -hmm. What we've done with the help sometimes with IV, of IVMED, we have a set of instruments that we jealously keep separately from the other instruments that we have in the OR, because it's, it's very challenging. Yes. And uh, that, that is, I think, one of the biggest challenges. Um, you know, ideally, in an ideal situation, you really need micro instruments, very fine instruments, very fine pickups. Um, and I think I touched upon that. You know, these, these tissues are really delicate. And if they are not handled correctly, you really can damage the um, blood supply. Um, and that can impact your outcomes significantly. And so obviously regular adult size instruments is really not going to work well with a hypospadias procedure. So I, I do think that that imparts some of the complication rates that we, that we see um, in centers who just don't have the pediatric micro instruments. I think unfortunately your, your complication rates are just going to be a little bit higher. Thank you. Um, any other question from the floor? Any comment? Hey, Dr. Jalo. Yeah, Dr. I just, I, I just want to add some comment. Please. Before that, I would like to thank yeah. Daniel for this great talk. Mm. And just to say that um, this surgery is very complex. And uh, I have been working since more than 10 years now for Ivy Med support with Dr. Schneck and other guys coming from US. And we have learned a lot, but we still realize that complication rate is still high. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but thankfully we are improving our practice and also mm -hmm. we work more in a better condition because I get my first loops mm -hmm. yeah. Dr. Schneck, and yeah. often I get some set of microsurgical instruments and I keep it very jealously when <laughs> <Yes. laughs> I share it with Dr. Jalo sometimes. Yeah. So. <laughs> Always. <laughs> <laughs> so I am, I am really happy that yeah. you end your speech with a call for people to set some multi-institutional work mm -hmm. because um, this, this math abnormalities, um, the problem in West Africa is that we don't have enough skills, mm -hmm. uh, like enough urologists or pediatric surgeons who do it very mm -hmm. often. That's why when we organize 
um, workshops, people come from Mali, from mm -hmm. Gambia, from Guinea. Not far from two days ago, when people called me from Mali asking me oh. how to do with his kids, five months mm -hmm. years, he's mm -hmm. scared because he don't want to um, to bring his uh, child every, uh, where he don't know. So it, it's really to launch an appeal for mm -hmm. all the West African country to try to set up a register mm -hmm. of high posters, of complication, and also of the needs and skills technique to, to really appreciate what we can do further. Uh, of course, with the help of IBMET, it will be very welcomed. Yes, I, I Oh, I know that. Um, oh, am I am I muted? Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah we do. Okay, hear okay. Um, uh, yeah, and I know, I know. Um, Francis has been working on that, and has really the last couple times we've been on these trips together has we we've talked about a registry and just how valuable that would be. I think one of the biggest things as surgeons, it's it's hard sometimes to admit when you have a complication, and sometimes I don't know if it's ego or pride. But it's hard. It's hard to, to say, you know, I did an operation that did not work well. But I think it's so important for us to get over that because I don't think as a field that we can really advance or improve until we admit our, our, our complications. And it's not, it's not laying blame. It's just saying this didn't go as expected and how can I learn from this and how can I change? And I think that that's one, it's a call to all of the surgeons to, to really be honest and take a hard look at our cases and, and maybe admit when they don't go as well as we thought they did, because the only thing we're gonna do is learn from that. And so I, I do think that registries are so important. And I do think that um, really evaluating your, your steps and your processes is, is only gonna make you better. It, it's, not, it's not to call out or to shame or anything like that. It really is it's just a mad means of, of trying to improve. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you that it's the only way we can mm -hmm. have to improve our skills, to improve our practice, and to improve the care we, we offer to the patient. Yeah. I think that Dr. Jalo is at a very good uh, point because he's the power secretary general, and maybe he can just um, uh, contact uh, surgeons in some countries and try to set up something yeah he, he yeah he, he's very efficacious for for this kind of thing so yeah. i asked him to help me to start something <laughs> I, I'm, 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 I'm just the, i'm just the servant of all of you guys whatever you command me i'll do it <laughs> so you just start and we follow you thank you <laughs> so i have two more questions no 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 right you now. just give your order and i'll, I'll be the servant <laughs> so i agree that we should uh, communicate more yeah. do some yeah. surveys and yeah. Try to yeah, so, set up some kind of. So my question to Daniel is my question to Daniel is about uh, the testosterone therapy. I yeah. use topical, mm -hmm. and my experience is sometimes when the kids come, they have some hair on the yes. pubis, and I would like to know what are the complications you have met in your practice, mm -hmm. and also if a parent come with this kind of complication, what are the speech you will have to to give to them. Yes. And my second question will be about the gland. Can you tell us what are your tips and tricks to make it statical, yes. <laughs> acceptable presentation? Because it's a very hard part, I think. Yes, yes. yes. So, yes. so for your first question about testosterone treatment, yes. I mean, I am uh, hair, development of hair, um, especially with the local, like using a topical, um, is something I tell the parents right away, um, just because I, you don't want them to be surprised by that. Um, and I say, you know, we need to use this, this hormone cream. It's going to really change the tissues and really improve them and make it so that it's going to give him a better outcome. But there are some things that, some side effects to that. Um, one of which is the um, growth of some hair. Now, for the most part, the hair that grows, I mean, it's noticeable, but it's not like adult pubic hair. Um, and so I, I usually when I have that discussion and let them know that this is probably going to happen, they usually don't 
they aren't too upset when they see it and they come in and they say, oh yes, yes, he did develop some hair there. And I said, you know, um, over time it, it could fade. And obviously as he gets older, he's gonna grow pubic hair there anyway. So it's not like this is going to be a life altering side effect. Um, the other thing I do tell parents and I, like I said, I always try to set them up for the worst and, you know, set them up for the worst and expect the best. But I also tell them that sometimes you can see some behavioral changes with um, younger kids with the testosterone. Um, I can't say I've seen it very frequently, but, you know, there have been reports of, um, you know, increased, I don't want to say aggressive behavior, but, but they notice a behavior change in, in their toddler with the, with the um, testosterone. So I usually mention that as well, just because if it's not a surprise, um, they tend to accept some of those side effects a little bit better. You know, if you don't mention it at all and all of a sudden they come in and their two-year-old has pubic hair and is acting, is acting out, um, they tend to be a little bit more anxious about that. So I think just, just being full disclosure and letting them know that that's a possibility that it can happen um, does help. Did you, did you worry about impairment of growth? No, no. I, you know, it's, it's such a short okay. course. I mean, you're really not using it more, you know, four to six weeks. Um, that no, I, I haven't, I haven't, I don't worry too much about that. And I, you know, it's, um, I mean, usually I go over all the systemic things that can happen with testosterone therapy, but, but, you know, I haven't really seen any long-term, real long-term problems with it. Okay. Oh, and then your second question, I'm sorry, can you re remind me of the second question? It was, oh, the glands, the glands. Yeah, yeah. the glands. So I think the one of the most important things about the glands is making sure that when you develop your glands um, wings, is you are very you need to be very aggressive with that. Um, the deeper and I know sometimes it's scary to make really deep cuts in there, but I think that that mobilization helps so much to take it off attention. Um, also, and it's something I actually learned from from Francis from Fran Schneck is when I was a fellow doing cases with him, you have to be very meticulous about how you throw that, that, that closure stitch, that mattress stitch. And I can remember him making me throw it and taking it out and re-throwing it and taking it out and re-throwing it because it wasn't perfect. And I remember getting irritated that I was six or seven times that I've done it. But I think his point being is, is that you really have to have that attention to detail and be so meticulous about how your stitches are thrown, um, how the tissues are lining up, because it really can impact um, healing. Um, so I think those are probably my two, um, two biggest take-homes. Oh, and the other thing is really, if you're doing a tip repair, is really making sure that your transverse incision is pretty deep. Um, the deeper the groove, that's gonna give you a little bit more ability to bring over those, the glands on, on top of the neourethra. So I think um, all three of those little tricks, tricks work, but yeah, you gotta be pretty aggressive um, in order to, to free up some of those flaps. Does it happen sometimes for a primary repair that you say, this gland is so tiny that I can't even roll it up? Yeah, yeah, um, yes. And, and sometimes that does happen. I think there's a couple of options that you can do with that. Um, you can come back, um, you can, basically bring the urethra up to maybe like the coronal margin, like subcoronal margin, coronal margin, um, and leave the glands open and then come back and do a, um, like a, um, like a, like a graft, like put some mucosal, um, buccal mucosa in there uh, as a later stage. Um, you know, the downside to that is obviously you're committing to, um, you know, an additional surgery. And usually that can be done in one stage. It's a pretty small one. It's a pretty small buccal harvest. And two, it's a pretty small graft site. And so you can usually get away with doing that as a one stage. But um, yeah, there's been a couple occasions where we, we've had to, to do that. And I think it's better to stop and commit to that stage versus going forward with a glansplasty that you're not happy with that you know is probably going to break down because it's just too tight and the tissues are, are you know, are setting themselves up for necrosis, which then ultimately sets you up for a more difficult reoperation. So, um, yeah, so sometimes, I mean, that, that can be, that's tricky. And, and sometimes, um, and sometimes you get stuck with that, but, um, I'll tell you, reoperating on the glands is, is tedious 
and it's hard. And um, I would much rather just stop and say, I'm going to have to come back at a later time and put in a, put in a, a, a graph. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're Thank welcome. you. We, we have Dr. John Lazarus who wanted to make a comment. Dr. Lazarus, can you unmute yourself, please? John Lazarus. For the others, we have some more questions, but for now, because Hello. for the sake of time. Yeah, Dr. Lazarus. Uh, Mohammed, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Danielle, thank you for your talk. Very uh, interesting. Thank you. Uh, proximal hyperspadius, uh, we've gone through a learning curve of uh, believing what Warren Snodgrass in Texas taught us that mm -hmm. a long tip is a good option. Yeah. I think in my hands, I've often ended up with some degree of uh, cordy. Mm -hmm. so I've moved away from that. We did the ducket. We did the Kalkani, mm -hmm. not the Kalkani, the mm -hmm. uh, Koyanagi, mm -hmm. and a few, a few others. And we've ended up by doing a two stage. Mm -hmm. Have we failed? Uh, should we be retrying doing a one stage? What, what would your recommendation to us be? Well, you know, I, I think there's an expression, um, there's lots of ways to skin a cat. Um, and so I'm a firm believer in that what works for me um, is not necessarily the best operation for you. Um, and I, I think that it's, if you just were not getting the success rates in doing a long tip procedure, um, and you were getting better outcomes from doing a different type of procedure. I think, I think that's okay. I think, I think what is important is, is that you need to get over the learning curve for whatever procedure that you, you that you are, want to do, um, become really good at it, look at your outcomes, see if there's any means for improvement. And if you get to the point where you're saying, you know, I'm doing a pretty good operation here. I've really honed my skills. I would like to try this again, um, maybe doing a one stage. I think it's, it's a bit of a step, it's like a, 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 a step, you know, step up. So I think, I, I don't think it's that you failed. I, I think it's just, um, it's just honing that, that craft, honing that technique. And so I think if you're comfortable doing two stages, if you have an ideal patient that says, okay, you know what, I might try this as a, you know, a long proximal tip then try it. But I would make sure it's the right patient. You know, you don't want to set yourself up for failure by picking the most difficult, you know, patient with terrible tissues um, and saying, this is the one I'm going to try it in. I really would try it in your, you know, really handpick which patient it is that you want to try that technique in. But, but in, in the, but at the same token, I wouldn't be, you know, it's all about volume and it's all about repetitive to get over that learning curve. And so I would, I would kind of concentrate on well, if you're getting good outcomes on one procedure, really do that for a while until you've really kind of gotten it down and then, then sort of build upon that. So don't give can up. I just, yeah. can, I, can I clarify uh, what you're actually doing with your one stage? You said you do some long tips. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I was intrigued to see that you would use a buckle in a primary case. Mm -hmm. I've always used that for uh, redo cases, but mm -hmm. you're saying that you would rather do a one stage buckle, and and then how do you what what operation is that? I've not read about that as a one stage proce first stage procedure. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, a very special patient that fits into that criteria. Um, um, you know, I think at least in the United States, there has been a lot of push about anesthesia risks in children. And we have a lot of parents who come to us who, you know, we'll start talking about stage procedures and they will come in and say, I do not want a stage procedure for my child. I'm worried about multiple anesthesias over time and the risks and, you know, development. Um, therefore, I only want one procedure, you know, how can we accomplish this? Um, and I had um, one, of my, one of my partners um, who has, long, long experience with buckle grafts, um, was having some really good outcomes doing a primary buckle graft repair. Um, like I said, I think those patients, they're, they're, again, they're very hand-picked. Um, the, you know, the, the core D situation has to sort of be the right scenario. Um, everything, the stars all have to align for that patient to, to, to really work in that fashion. But we have actually had some, some good results with that. Um, it's not every patient, that's for sure. Um, 
So you're laying the buckle into the uh, cut urethral plate and then you're putting an onlay uh, like a ducket tube, but actually just an onlay, island flap? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah. And it, 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 again, again, time it depends on um, how the perpetual skin on that side, on that one, how that looks as well. Yeah. But what we're doing is we're lying it in place and we're kind of augmenting that, the urethral plate, and then we're, we're, we're doing it in one stage. Well, like I said, we've had Thank some good Thank you very much. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. So thank you. We've gone largely beyond the time, and 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 I know we are, we've abused you today, but that was for the good sake. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Srini. Thank you, as yes. you met, and thank you for all the the member for for the, those who have any other question. You have the email. You can send yes. an email for yeah, please. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So thank feel free you to again, email and me. We mm -hmm. hope to have you next time. Yeah. Because this has been a very, very successful session. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Yes, I enjoyed uh, uh, giving Thank this presentation. You. Thanks for having me. It yeah. was great. Thank, Thank you, you Danielle. <laughs> Thanks. Danielle, do you ever not use catheters or feeding tubes? Just the last one question. Oh, that's a good question. So, um, Francis um, oftentimes does not. Um, I, I, you know, I went through a period of time where I was not using catheters and I had some complications. So I, I tend to use them. So, um, I'm still using them, but Francis, there's in certain patients, he will do it without a catheter and his outcomes are good. I just, I don't know. Maybe, um, I don't know. I lose sleep at night if I don't leave a catheter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Right. Mohammed, you got to talk to yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, professor. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> bye. Yeah. All bye right. Bye. Well, thank you all so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>